be starting into chapter nine on EMC. Now, this is an area I teach, uh, and I'm going to try to I'll go a little bit beyond what he has in the next couple of things. But what we're going to do is start by saying uh, we'll deal with any kind of component, even wires at high frequency. They don't look like simple wires anymore. They're not perfect conductors. Now, but what we do is we'll start with, and this is going to be EMC, and that's EMI. It's really electromagnetic compatibility or electromagnetic interference. So these are the tools you need to understand that. It's a real important lecture to get you at least thinking in terms of high frequency effects, which is, has a lot of things, a lot of problems happen with high frequency. And the reason we talk so much about this now and we did it in 1950 and 1960 is because everything has a digital clock. And a digital clock causes the frequency spectrum that's available to be wide. You think about just 60 hertz signal there, well, very, very low frequency. When you take a digital waveform clocking at one gigahertz, you're gonna get a fundamental of one gigahertz, but you're going to get harmonics with a fair amount of power all the way up the spectrum. And that's what you have to be aware of. The high frequency effects are things that often dominate with EMI and EMC problems, not the low frequency. So, first we start with wires. And Dr. Wolf's book does a pretty good deal on this. He starts and he says, if we have a general wire, and the wire has a length L, and it has a radius A, and the wire has a conductivity sigma, and for wires, sigma for copper is about 5.7 or 5.8 times 10 to the seventh, and that's one over ohm meters or Siemens per meter. That's typical. Silver and gold are of the order of 10 to the seventh, a little less. Well, if you have this, and that's the conductivity, and you want to know the resistance between the ends here, this is plus to minus some voltage, and now I'm putting the current here, and I want to know the resistance between the end. You've done this problem before. And this is going to be a DC. So this is going to be RDC, which means it's low frequency or very low frequency. Well, the way you get, remember how to get RDC from this if you were asked to do this on an interview? How to get the resistance of that? Let me ask you this. What do you think resistance is? Is it proportional or inver inversely proportional to length? Proportional. Yeah, that's right. Now, what about area? Is it proportional, inversely proportional to area? Inversely. inversely good, right. Now, and what about conductivity? Is it proportional, inversely proportional to conductivity? Inverse. Inverse. As a matter of fact, you've told me all I need to know. Area here for a circular cross section is pi a squared. But the way you normally were taught to do this problem back in the day was you assume I. Then you calculate the current density. Do you remember what the current density was? I divided by the area it's perpendicularly going through. You assume it's uniformly distributed. So J would be equal to I over pi A squared. After you had J, then you calculated E, and E was equal to J over sigma. Do you all remember doing this? All right, so that means J is equal, I mean E is equal to I over pi A squared sigma. I'll call it the AZ direction to give this a, a coordinate field. Now once I have E, now I calculate V. And we know this V because we're going to get resistance. I don't really care about the sign. I'm going to take the mag magnitude of that voltage. Well, V is really equal to the integral from 0 to L of E dot DL. And DL would be DZ, since this is just going to be the integral of I over pi A squared sigma AZ dot DZ AZ from 0 to L. And lo and behold, you see the voltage is equal to simply AZ dot AZ as 1. When you integrate DZ, you get Z from 0 to L is just L. And then I get I. L over pi A squared sigma. That's the voltage I'm doing this. And I'm trying to go straight through logically. Therefore, the resistance is just voltage divided by current. 
and that's the DC resistance. So I just get rid of that current term. And that's the general set of steps you do anytime you want resistance of anything. You have to either assume a voltage or a current and then get all the other necessary things and find either the current or the voltage at the end and then take V over I. Now that's a, that's a uh, DC or low frequency. When we talk about high frequency effects, this is now something where we define high frequency in terms of something called skin depth. Can you remember skin depth? The skin depth The symbol for it is delta, and it's equal to 1 over alpha, or it's equal to 1 over the square root of pi f mu sigma. That's, this is the one I remember, 1 over the square root of pi f mu sigma. And this, again, is for a good conductor. And it doesn't make sense to talk about wires that aren't good conductors. All right? Y'all remember this, guys? This is a good conductor. Now, when we have the skin depth, we'll make a case that if and only if the skin depth is less, matter of fact, say much less than A, and this is the case for almost all high frequency problems. So the skin depth is going to be small in terms of the radius, the radius of the wire is A. Then we can say, if we look at this wire, we can say that really, if this thickness right here is one skin depth, that all the current will be contained if I go ahead and I plug in I here. Plus or minus B here, plug in I. All that current is going to be within one skin depth of the outer edge. Do you follow me on this, everyone? It's not going to flow in the center. It's all going to be concentrated on the edge, and you can assume it's uniformly distributed. <coughs> so now I can say if this is the case, if this is the case, now I can say that I is assumed, J would be equal to simply I divided by the area. And the way you get the area is this is still A. So the easy way to do it, some people say we'll take pi A squared minus pi a minus lambda or minus delta squared. That would be the area of the outer circle minus the area of the inner circle is the area that remains. But it's just as easy to say if this is in fact true. Just take 2 pi times A times the skin depth, and that would be the area of this strip. You follow me? If you just cut this strip and roll it out, it would have a length of 2 pi A, right? And the thickness is simply delta, so it's 2 pi A delta. In other words, the area here becomes 2 pi a times the skin depth. And you could say it's in the az direction. Then you go through and say, if that's j, I get e. e again would just be j over sigma. And that would be i over 2 pi a delta the skin depth times sigma az. Agree with me? And then we get the voltage, and the voltage would just be the integral of E dot DL, where the voltage would be equal to the integral. Now, I know when you get voltage, usually it's between A and B, and there's minus the integral between A and B of E dot DL. You can forget about that minus sign, because the voltage, the resistance will be strict positive. The voltage will be strict positive. You follow? Just take the magnitude of voltage over current. So here, I go from 0 to L of i over 2 pi a delta az and dl in this case would be vz az and you can see now that the voltage az dot az would cancel is simply going to be i times l over 2 pi a delta and to get the resistance what do i do just get by divide by i and when I divide by I, I get this. And that's R. Now that's R high frequency, or Dr. Whitworth's book has AC. I like to put HF here, high frequency. And the key thing is this has to be true. Yes, sir. Oh, how did I miss that? 
Absolutely. I want to say one other thing. For any, any, any long wire, regardless of its cross section, the way you always get the resistance, regardless, high frequency, low frequency, R in general is proportional it's to the length, inversely proportional to the area, but that's the area the current's flowing through. So if it's a high frequency problem, it's just on the outer rim. If it's low frequency, it's the entire cross section. And it doesn't matter if it's a circular cross section, a square cross section, a hexagonal cross section, it doesn't matter. It's the area it's flowing through, and then divide by sigma. And that will work always, but remember, that A is a function of frequency. That's the thing. So that's what a resist, that's what a wire looks like in terms of its resistance. Now, when we, is there about, any questions about this? We've had this before. There's nothing new here. Um, the next thing to talk about is what does a wire look like, and I can leave this drawing here actually, uh, in terms of inductance, but let me do something here. Let me get rid of all this junk. Now, inductance is a little tricky. I'll tell you why. This is important. At this point in your career, you get a handle on this and understand this. Because when you get out in the real world, you're going to see not understanding this can cause some big problems. All right, now, if this wire is by itself, and this, this is a closed circuit. Matter of fact, let me do it this way. Suppose I have a wire that's this long. I want to just talk about something a little more proportionally accurate. And I got a wire like this, and there's a plus to minus V here, all right? Now, it causes a current I, right? I want you to think about this. I flows here, I flows here, I flows here, and I flows here, right? We can make the argument, if we were looking at this, first, in order for what, we, for what I'm about to tell you to uh, actually be something you can do, you have to know the actual geometry of the closed circuit. And this is very, very important. When I look at this, I can take a look at this top part, and I can calculate the H field everywhere. Do you agree, at least theoretically, you could write an equation for that in terms of the bias of our law? You can say it's IDL crossed into AR, divided by four pi r squared, right? Then you could integrate that over the entire loop and get the H field there. And then to get the total magnetic energy, you would have to integrate one half mu H squared, that's the magnetic energy density, over all of space except where the wire is. Did you follow me on that class? That is a non-trivial calculation. But there's also an inductance associated with the internal or internal magnetic energy storage ability of the wire. Y'all follow me on that? Because it's called the internal inductance is all the magnetic, in, all the inductance associated with all the magnetic, magnetic energy inside the wire. And the external inductance is that with the magnetic energy outside the wire. In case this is news to you, one half, if for any given current configuration, one half Li squared is equal to one half times the integral of B dot H over the entire volume where B and H exist caused by that current. You remember this, people? The way they usually write this is they get rid of the halves and they say L is equal to one over I squared. They just get rid of the half. And then they put an integral here of mu times magnitude of H squared dV. And that's over the entire volume. Now that's what the inductance is in general. And it's an energy formula. There's also a way to calculate inductance using what's called flux linkage, the gross flux a lot. But this is some, this is absolutely true. Now if you think about this for a second, you gotta know H everywhere to get this formula, right? Usually we don't have that luxury. In general, when we talk about inductance, we talk about the internal inductance of a wire, and then we talk about a way of estimating the outside inductance just from the energy caused by the current flowing here. And we assume free space, which is a completely false, false assumption when you're near a conducting plane. But it's called the, the theorem of partial inductances, and it's actually pretty accurate, but it's 
graduate level material. Just be aware of this. Do you have questions? Okay. So now, having said that, if we talk just solely about the internal inductance of that wire, this gives us a bottom line value for the inductance. In general, it's much larger than this, but it's necessary to do it. The way we do it is this. We stop, we stop actually, uh, I'm not gonna use this drawing, but I'm gonna draw a little one to give myself a little more room. What you do is this, we're gonna do the same kind of deal. We're gonna cause, I'm gonna have a wire of some radius A, and I'm gonna assume I'm putting a current into the wire here, caused by V, but V doesn't matter in this case. And when I do that, what I'm going to do is take a look at the magnetic energy inside this region of the wire, call it a length L. Matter of fact, let's make L equal to one meter, that way it would be the inductance per unit meter. We can say, assume it's very long, all right? Now the way you do this is you assume a very long wire, and well, let me do it this way. I'm going to say if I flows into this wire and the current is uniformly distributed, call this the z direction, then I can say that j is equal to i over the, the cross-sectional area, or simply i over pi a squared az. Y'all agree with me there? Now once I do that, I need something else to do this calculation. I need the h field. So now I come out of radial distance rho, and I say that h phi at a radial distance rho can be gotten by Ampere's law. Remember, if Ampere's law, what did you do? You put an Amperean loop, right? And you set of currents flowing down there, huh? I'm gonna put my thumb in the direction, the h field's swirling like this, do you all remember that, right hand one? So my h field's in the phi direction, and then I say that the integral of h dot dl around the closed loop is equal to the integral of j dot ds over the surface. Now, I don't know how much you remember about that, but if this is my closed loop, my surface is the internal area perpendicular to the current flow. You all remember this? It's been a while, but you remember? It's a really important law. So here, I'll take this over here. Now when I do this, the integral of h dot dl, first, I didn't say this, but you have to be able to see it's circularly symmetric, or cylindrically symmetric, which means that the h field at this point has to be the same as the h field at that point, because if you took that thick wire and stood it up straight and you started rotating it, it looks the same. There's, it's invariant in, in terms of what it looks like. So h, you can make the argument, h has to be the same at any given radial distance. In magnitude. So the integral of h dot dl is really going to be the length of the parameter, which would be what? Anyone? Two pi rho. That's right, 2 pi rho. It would be 2 pi rho times h phi. That's this side. And now I got to set it equal to this, right? And that's equal to the integral of j. Well, j is actually a constant, right? It's that. Ds, but I, I can go ahead and do it. It would be the integral of j here, which is i over pi a squared, right there, az, times the differential surface element, and you don't have to make it this complicated, but the differential surface element here is really gonna be rho d phi times d rho, and it's in the az direction, and the integral from phi goes from zero to two pi. I think everybody knows that. And rho goes from zero to rho. Now that's a formal way to do it. I can say the informal and easy way is since j is a constant, just find what j is and multiply it by that area, which is pi, pi rho squared. That's the easy way. You don't have to do it this formally. But if you did it this formally, you would say h phi here would be equal to one over two pi rho, because I'm taking that over there. And then when I do the integrations here, from zero to two pi brings out a two pi, right? Because there is no, nothing but d phi here. And when I integrate rho, d rho, I get rho squared over two from zero to rho, 
or really it's going to be just rho squared over two, and then it's going to be times i over pi a squared. Now, I've got to tell you this right now. Uh, technically, in order to integrate from zero to rho, this should be a rho prime here because you can't have anything inside the integration, any symbol that has to do with the limits of the integration. That's illegal. And I think you know that from mathematics, from your math courses. It doesn't matter, though. It's the same thing anyway. We just do a different symbol if it'll work properly. And here you can see this goes away, right? And one of those rows goes away. And so I have now h phi equal to i over pi a squared, right? And then it's times uh, rho divided by 2. Y'all, are you, you all agree with me? Here's where I'm going with this. Let me go back this way. I want to get the inductance using this formula. Really, using this formula. This formula is fine. I could put mu zero h for b, but I'm going to do that. And you can forget about the one halves. It comes down to this. So, let me go through this with you. Because we're going to do this to get the dc inductance. This is dc inductance. When I take a look at this h field, I'm going to make myself, make it easy on myself. I'm just going to call that J naught. That's the, that is simply the current density. All right. So then I have H phi equal to J naught over two rho. Follow me on this, guys. I'm just making it easy so I don't have to keep carrying the I over pi A squared through and through. Now when I have that, I need H squared next. So h phi magnitude squared would be equal to j naught over 2 squared rho squared. Agree? Now I go, does everybody understand how I came from here to here? I divided by i squared, got rid of the 1 halves, right? They're on both sides. And then I replaced b with mu 0 h. Just so everybody knows, b is equal to mu h. Well, mu zero if it's non, non ferrite A great class? So now I have h squared. Now I have to execute this integral. Now I can take the mu naught out the front. And now I have L equal to 1 over i squared. And I can take the mu naught or mu out in front. And then I have an integral here. Well, and since it's per meter, it's only a double integral of h squared, which is j naught over two squared times rho squared. And I have to multiply that by the differential volume in cylindrical coordinates. Do you all remember what that is? Differential volume in cylindrical coordinates. I know it's gonna be dz, but since I'm integrating from zero to one, I don't care about that, right? And I also know it's gonna be d rho, but then there's that rho d phi. Remember the white the wrong way? So really, most of the time, they put rho d phi, then they put d rho, and then dz. Since dz is just going to integrate from 0 to 1, I leave it out. Now, when you do this integration, first, this phi goes from 0 to 2 pi, right? And where does rho go from? I erased it, but from 0 to a, right, to the outer radius. 0 to a. And that would be the inductance. Let's see what it is. That's mu over i squared, right? Now I can take this j naught over 2 squared out in front. j naught is i over pi a squared squared, right? Then when I integrate from d phi from 0 to 2 pi, I get 2 pi, don't I, guys? And then when I integrate rho cubed d rho, I get rho to the fourth over four, don't I? So then I get rho to the fourth over four from zero to a is just a to the fourth over four, and that's the inductance per meter. Now, uh, I'm gonna make a comment here. I'm not trying to bore you, but I just wanna make sure you see what I'm up to. You see how the i's cancel? I got i squared there, i squared there, so I just get rid of them. 
By the way, I know the I squared is always canceled with the W, so I don't usually even put down I. I assume it's one, one half. Now next, I take a look at this, and I see that I have an A squared squared, or A to the fourth, one over A to the fourth, and I see I have an A to the fourth here, don't I? So I can get rid of that next. Do y'all see what I'm up to? So I get rid of that. That's one thing I like about whiteboards. You're doing long problems. If you ever get into grad school, and especially the doctorate program, when you get some of these advanced courses that are steeped in mathematics, these kinds of boards are great to put them on because otherwise you find yourself erasing like crazy a lot of stuff. Now I'm down to that point. Now what do you see happening here? Um, wait a second. Did I... This is a one fourth here. Now, if you take a look at what L is, you're going to get mu, and then you got pi squared single pi, so it's divided by pi. Then I got two squared is four, right? Take two, so it's really two down here because one of those twos gets canceled. Two times four is eight. And that right there is in Henry's per meter, and that is the inductance. It's usually written as eight pi the internal inductance of a wire, but it's only the internal inductance. So you gotta put this as internal. And the actual real inductance of that wire may be more due to the energy around it than the energy contained within it. You have to be aware of that. Cases where that's not the case, that's a case where it's not that way, is in a coax cable. If you have a big inner core and you have an outer sheet that's close to it, then generally speaking, the thing you can make the argument that most of the energy is in the inner core, but that's for a coax system because there are no magnetic fields outside the coaxis outer radius. Coax cables have current going one way, then the other way, and therefore the magnetic field outside the outer rim of that coax cable is zero. That's the one exception. But in general, if I just have a wire from that wall to that wall, most of the inductance is, out, is due to energy outside the internal, all right? So that's L, and call this LDC too. There's one interesting thing about that. Take a careful look. That's inductance per unit meter. Does the wire's radius play any bearing on that? That's one of the unusual things about this. The inductance doesn't matter if the wire's this thick or if it's that thick. It's the same amount of magnetic energy internal to it, huh? I mean, it's the same inductance, internal inductance, not external, internal. All right, now, what happens if all of a sudden I don't have So the wire's radius and the length don't have anything to do That's with it? That's per meter, though. So it's per twice meter. as long. Oh, okay. yeah. the length definitely has something to do with it. But this is only internal, then. Gotcha. And I'm going to tell you, this, this is a, something that a lot of people that are just kind of hacks at engineering, they'll take a look at this, and they'll say, that's the inductance of our wire. Big mistake. First, this is not the high frequency inductance. And second, it's not the total inductance, it's just the internal inductance, all right? Be careful about that. Uh, it's hard for me to get an idea where you guys are going to go. Most engineers don't know what they're going to do at this stage in the game. If you get into anything where you're building real stuff, if you're at the level of a small company that's always doing this, then you have to be aware of all these things. I mean, if you're at Intel and you're in a VLSI that's mass development, you're not going to see this. But you will see it in general if you're a smaller company or if you're doing product, I mean, the final product development and rollout and you bring it out to the public. Now, what about high frequency or now it's still internal inductance, but now we're talking about high frequency. Well, 
immediately you assume this. This is going to be much greater than radius A of that wire. I erased my wire, but I think you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to say the wire has a radius A, conductivity sigma, and let's, for the intent of this course, make this L equal one, one meter, so it's all inductance per unit meter. It's still internal, though, all right? Now, remember when I got the high frequency resistance, what was the assumption? That all the current was on the edges right there, correct? Remember that? It was within one skin depth. So now, the way this one works, J is still equal to I over A, but now it's I over 2 pi A skin depth in the AZ direction. Just like it was for the high frequency resistance, right? Now we just take the perimeter times the thickness, the skin depth, and that's the area. Then we get the H field. And what would the H field be? Well, I mean, how would you get it? It's always the integral of H dot DL around the closed loop is equal to the integral of J dot DS, correct? Over the surface. This is where it's a little tricky though. Remember, all that current starts at rho, but really at A minus the skin depth, right? And it's limited from there to A. Y'all following this? There's no current at the center if we assume the high frequency thing. It's all, all the current is right on the edge of this wire. If we're assuming that I put an I in here, just assume for now I'm I. It's all distributed evenly around one skin depth, and it gives that, that J, right? Can you all see this right here? All right, now what's H gonna be? Well, this side of the integral is always what? If you had went with, you know it. Isn't it just the perimeter? But it's not A, it's two pi rho, isn't it? And then it's times H phi. So this will always be two pi rho H phi. Y'all understand when I say per perimeter, I mean circumference. The circumference is something of, of, of a radius rho is just two pi rho. So that side's always that. Now what about this side? This is the, this is the fun one. Well, the J would be equal to the current density and I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this current density just K, A, Z, and call K equal to I over 2 pi A delta. Because you can see I got a lot of crap to carry down in my handwriting today. And I often drop things. Right? So now I put K, A, Z here. So it's just K, A, Z. And it's times the differential surface and cylindrical coordinates. What's the differential surface here? If this is Z and we're in cylindrical coordinates, it's, do you remember? I'm pressing you on Friday, or on Wednesday. Rho D phi, D rho, right? Isn't that right, class? Rho D phi is the white bar on length. It's, it's this length here, is the, the distance rho. Rho D phi and then D rho goes outward. So it would be rho D phi, D rho, A, Z. All right, where does phi go from? That's a, usually a gimme. Yeah. And where does uh, rho go from? Where does the current start at? From A minus the skin depth, right? The inner radius is, remember, think about this. That's one skin depth thick. So it starts from here, which would be what? A minus that skin depth, correct? Can y'all see that? You see, you got good eyes if you can see it. Can you can see it? And it goes all the way out to A, right? So this one goes from A minus the skin depth to A. Now I'm gonna pick it up here. Can y'all see how I can divide one over two pi rho right here and put H phi out by itself? So now I can say that H phi is just equal to one over two pi rho. And then it's gonna be this. Now, take note here. What happens, I got az dot az is one. Give me that, guys. And then what happens when I have d phi integrated from zero to two pi? I get just two pi, so I'm gonna put the two pi out by itself. 
Now, when I integrate rho d rho, I get rho squared over 2, right? And it's evaluated from here to here. I'll put it up here so you can see. So it's rho squared over 2 evaluated from a minus delta minus skin depth to a. First, you give me all this up down here. Can you see it, Jay? Yes, sir. All right. I'm trying to get H. Why do I want H? Because I got to get H squared so I can get the magnetic energy density and integrate it through that over the region. I want the internal inductance. Also, multiply by K. Yes, thank you. <laughs> trying to look to keep you guys interested. I'm losing. I guess I'm not concentrating all that there. All right, now one thing you can see is the two pi goes away. You agree with that? So I want to get rid of that first. Now the next thing, uh, the row does not go away because this is a hard evaluation. So I have H phi equals K over rho, and then it's going to be times divided by two actually because I can take that two out in front. And then it's going to be a squared minus the quantity a minus delta squared. Y'all agree with me? That's h. We can go in here and I can prove to you the a squared is going to cancel. I'll just show you this. If we have a squared minus a minus delta squared, that's equal to a squared minus the quantity a squared plus delta squared minus 2a delta. Does everybody see that? And then you can see the a squared is canceled, and now I have simply uh, minus 2a delta minus delta squared. I mean, plus 2a delta minus delta squared. Do you follow me on this? And here's one thing. It, it, this has to do with the order of accuracy of the problem. If this is stipulated, oh man, I put it the wrong way. Somebody should have yelled at me. If A is much greater than delta, in other words, the radius is much larger, so sorry about that. I'll try to do better, I should have had some problems. Are you with me on this? In other words, this it's the skin depth is much less than A, it's high frequency, all right? If that's the case, then I can come over here and I can get rid of this because if this is much less than a, right, then 2a times delta is much, much greater than delta squared. Just think of if a is 1 and delta is 100. 2 times 1 divided by 100 is 50, right? If this is, is going to be, if it's uh, 1 over 100 there, uh, that's going to be 1 over 10,000. It's irrelevant. Follow me on that? So you can get rid of this. Which means this whole thing now is H phi is equal to K over 2 rho, and then I have simply quantity 2A delta. Do you agree with me, class? I'm not trying to bore you, trust me. I'm trying to just take you through this because the book doesn't do it. Now, you see the twos go away, right? Agree with that? Now, I don't need h phi, I need h phi squared, don't I? So what happens when I have h phi squared? That's going to be k a delta divided by rho squared, isn't it? Agree with me? Now, we know that k is up here. That comes at the end of the day. I worry about throwing that back in. And now I need to get the inductance. So let me get rid of this, the internal inductance. Okay, remember from before I said that L was equal to 1 over I squared times mu times a double integral of H squared, magnitude of H squared over the volume, correct? Remember? All right, well, what happens here? Now I have L equals 1 over I squared. Got a double integral. I'm going to put the U right here. 
right? And now I put that, so I have Ka delta squared. Why don't I take that out in front? Put that out in front, so I have Ka delta squared. Remember that K is <laughs> the thing I erased. Do you all remember that that K was that constant we had before class? Now I've got this. I've got a double integral, and I've got 1 over rho squared. But now it's the differential volume in cylindrical coordinates. The differential volume will be rho d phi, right? d rho times dz. But we know z is going to go from 0 to 1, so we don't even bother with it, right? Now, what happens here? Now I get L is equal to mu over i squared times k a delta squared. Uh, let's see, phi goes from 0 to 2 pi, and rho goes from 0 to a. So when I do the phi integration, I get 2 pi. And then when I do the rho over rho, it's 1 over rho, it was natural log of rho. Agree? Agree, class? And now, uh, natural log of a, pardon me. And it's not zero to eight, pardon me on this one. I, I said something wrong. Uh, where does this go from? Not zero to eight, it's from A minus the skin depth, remember? Y'all remember that? So now what happens here is what? Now I get the log, when I integrate one over rho, D rho is natural log, and it's from A over A minus the skin depth. And there's an expansion for that. I don't know if you remember that uh, log of x had different forms of expansion. Do you all remember that when you got in calculator? In mathematics, did, there were all these things, remember the binomial expansion? One plus x to the nth power of x is small is one plus nx. Do you all remember that one? And then there's, there's different things for log x. Well, now here's the fun part. When you go in here, k, I don't know where it was. Well, what was k again? Let me put it in. L is equal to mu over i squared. K has i in it. It's I, I over 2 pi a times delta. All right. Uh, it's going to be k times a times delta squared times 2 pi times the natural log of a over a minus delta. Agreed? And here, we're going to just make some points. You all see how this i squared and this i squared cancel. So I erase it. Now do you see how a delta, a delta cancel? Now do you see how 2 pi over 2 pi is 1 over 2 pi? Good. And you're left with this basic relationship. And I don't think I left anything out. I think that's right. Now, so it's really this. I'm bringing the log over here. Times natural log of A over A minus delta. And here's where the magic occurs. I don't remember the exact expansion for this logarithm. And it's not in this book. But when all is said and done, you're getting said and done after the expansion, you're going to see that L is going to be equal to mu zero over, or mu, pardon me, over eight pi times two times delta over a. And I'll tell you, you could really put four pi a here, right? You follow me on that? In his book, he's gonna have probably this. He'll have mu delta over 4 pi a. I'm going to guess that's what he has for his high frequency resistance. But the way you get it, who's got The way you get this is this expansion. And I'm trying to think of the exact form of the expansion. We use this when we do conformal mapping. It's log of z uh, and that would be a over a minus delta is equal to
I'll get that later, but this is the bottom line. This is what the internal inductance is for high frequency right here. And what I like doing is this. What do you notice this is here, guys? What is mu over eight pi? The DC internal inductance. And that's the reason I like doing it this way. So I can say L internal high frequency or AC is really L DC times two delta over A. And I like doing it that way. That expansion, I'm trying to think of how to do that expansion. He has an equation in 9.7 that goes to like, well he, he has L in all of this and he doesn't do much because he's a computer. He has L in all of them. Well then he has L upstairs, right? Yeah, right. I don't, he has uh, mu over two pi times L and all of that times the natural log of two L over A. No, 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 that, that's, the, that's, the self, that's the external inductance. Okay. It's the partial inductance form. So I, you see that? Oh yeah, thank you. All right, now I, I, I'm gonna get to that. Gotcha, gotcha. But I wanna tell you, when you do this, this is the trick right here. If you look, when you expand that right there, what you end up doing is getting log A over log B. I'll just mention this, I won't do the whole thing. You don't have to write this. If you have natural log of A over A minus delta, that's equal to the log of A minus the log of A minus delta. Yeah. All right, with me on that? Now what you can do, and uh, this right here would be log of A minus log, and then you factor out an A here, of A, right, times one minus delta over A. Y'all follow me there? Now if I have log of A, B, right, that's log A plus log B, right? So then I get log of A minus log of A minus log of one minus delta over A. And the log A's cancel right there. With me? Then when you do the next part of this is the thing I'm trying to remember. There's an expansion. You can use binomial in there, get term by term, but it still isn't multiplicative. So there's a, there's a way to do this. And I think you set this equal to some constant K and then take both sides to e to the, you take e, e to the k is equal to one minus delta. Do you follow me on this? So if you had, I, I'm not trying to make a problem. e to the k would be equal to one minus delta over a. Then at that point, now I simply take this to the other side. Then I flip the signs like so. And then I take the log of both sides, and I think you can break it out that way, but I don't want to fuss with that here. I haven't done that one in a while. I'm just telling you that the whole secret, this is actually correct, completely correct what we have here, but it's hard to break that one out. So they usually do it, they break the whole thing out and leave it like that. I have another question. Sure. And it just looks like something funky, but so that it says the onset of skin effect resistance occurs at approximately A equals uh, here, here's what they're really getting at. Um, when, when you're at very low frequencies, what's the skin depth? Now, just think about this. Skin depth is equal to 1 over the square root of pi f mu sigma, right? Mm -hmm. And skin depth is how far into the wire we are, right? Well, what happens to that when f is 0? It goes to what? Infinity, doesn't it? Right? 1 over the square root of 0 is an infinite. Well, that means that if you use the high, if you use the formula, uh, if skin depth is less than uh, or is greater than a, it makes no sense to talk about that. Yeah. But they say now, when the skin depth hits about two, or I mean a over two, it's actually a over two. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, that formula works perfectly. Yeah, I, but, was, I thought it was funny because if you take that DC mm -hmm. inductance and multiply it by delta over delta. That's, yeah. you, get, you get that, exactly. I get that, so then when you just multiply the DC times delta over delta, you get that equation. He's saying that this is like a threshold equation. Yeah. And from that point on, you're right. So if you use that and just multiply, that just seemed weird to like multiply by one, you get <laughs> that equation that, we're looking, that we just found by doing all the, that other stuff. 
I just thought it was weird. It is. Uh, keep in mind this, this is only internal again. Remember, it, for most things, most things, unless you have shielded wires, the external inductance due to the magnetic field's energy outside that is gonna be dominant. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't have a lot of experience with weird, weird problems, but that's usually the case. But internal is very important too, because if you got shielded wires, then internal is gonna be probably large. Now, after that, keep in mind the per unit meter internal inductance of the wire. The next thing we get is this partial inductance formula. He doesn't do any proof on this. There's a lot of papers, I was looking at this earlier, that talk, talk about this. And the sole thing that matters is the path. You have to know the closed path that the wire takes because the closed path determines the inductance. And that is something where you don't know what it is most of the time. But you do know one thing about wires. Most of the magnetic energy is nearby. It's not out there at infinity. If you actually look at the magnetic energy, total magnetic energy versus distance from a wire, that it will be, if you take the total length of the wire, divide it by two. That's, you go that far out, you got like 99% of all the magnetic energy is inside the radius that would be L over two. If you think about a wire, a long wire, you all go out L over two, most of the magnetic energy is inside there. But it assumes you are not over a ground plane. It assumes there's no conductors nearby, and that can be a faulty assumption. Got me on that? So that's why I'm real careful about this. Now when you talk about partial inductance, and he's got this, um, I don't know what formula numbers. Now what happens if you look at that, now he's talking about the inductance for a given wire of a given length, and he's talking about, I believe it's external and internal, and if you look in the, and you read it. I don't, uh, I'm in my book right here, but. If you look at that, it's going to be a formula with a logarithm, and he's going to have L, and this is L partial. So this is the inductance for one wire, not the closed circuit, with some assumptions. First, no ground planes nearby. Second, the second wire, the return path's far away. And he gets it as this. It's mu, and then there's going to be the length of the wire L. So what i got to say is this. Now with my wire, it's going to radius A, it's got a length L, and it's going to have mu over length, or times length L. Uh, then it's going to be, actually, the way he has it, it's going to, yeah, times length L, and then there's the logarithm here, and that would be the logarithm, and I want to say it's two times the skin depth over A. Two L over A. Two L, pardon me, two L. My bad. It's L and L there over A. And there's this is over 2 pi, isn't it? Yes. And this is, again, inductance. So this is in Henry's. Now you notice it's L times log L. That's a minus 1 after the natural log. Um, so mu L over 2A. I mean, mu L over 2A. Minus pi 1. Times, right. Yeah. Is the minus 1 broken out from the log? Yes. Yeah. All right. When is the log log x equals one for what value? Uh, what is the log of e? Fine. Right. Yeah. What is e? Two point seven one something. Right. Yeah. So when this quantity is about two point seven one, it's of the order of one. But most of the time, l over a is going to be enormous. It's going to be a hundred or a thousand. So normally they don't even look at this one thousand. At least in my EMC course. You know, if you take the natural log of a thousand or ten thousand and subtract one for it, it's still about the natural log of a thousand or ten thousand. I say that, and now I'm thinking about that for a second. That's log base e, not log base ten. Log base ten is different because log of ten thousand is only four. But log base e is a lot bigger. You can check me on that one. This is what I'm used to seeing that. Like that. All right, and that's partial inductance. Somebody's going to ask me, do I need to memorize that form? You know, any of these things that we're going to be doing, I'll tell you about. Like, I'll give you that formula. That's not what you need to memorize or, or have it. Just be aware of it. Partial inductance is something that's a very complicated subject, and 
This only gives you a ballpark. It doesn't give you a real value. All right, now we're done with that. The next thing we talk about is we just covered wires and what they look like in terms of inductances and resistances at low and high frequency, right? Now we've got to talk about the components. And I want to say one thing about all these components. Resistors, capacitors, inductors, all at low frequencies look just like they're supposed to. So if you take a resistor, start here. A resistor, the symbol is generally given like this. That's R. And there's so many different types of resistors. The ones you've been exposed to are carbon resistors that have color codes on them, right? They have black, brown, red, and they go on to the different things, zero, one, two, all the way up and down, and they color code them. And that's from a long, long standing thing. I mean, still nowadays, when you buy new resistors, they'll have that color code, but printed on there will be like 10 ohms, 20 ohms, 100 ohms nowadays. Before they didn't, they didn't have a web. They, it was hard to do that. All right? but, so they have color codes. That doesn't matter. That's called a carbon resistor. Carbon resistors are usually rated in terms of the wattage they can actually, the power they can dissipate. If you go and triple the wattage or go to make it four times that, it usually those things eventually heat up and burn up. Those are carbon resistors. Most resistors that are used on, in, I mean, in VLSI structures, very large circuit integration, are simply pieces of silicon, dope silicon, that have a given length to cross-sectional area ratio. Because remember, it's proportional to length, inversely proportional to area, and if it's dope silicon, it has a value of conductivity that can be constructed. Now, resistors, just for the record, can do this. They can literally look like a river meandering. And they do that because they're trying to put a resistor in a very limited amount of space. So they try to squeeze them in any way they want if they need resistance. The key with resistances in small spaces is thermal dissipation. If you need, if you got a resistor, it's going to heat up if it's being used, and you have to be sure you can thermally dissipate that. Or if you can't, it'll heat up and either melt or just go into a breakdown state like that. It'll just have a, a thermal shock and tear. Be aware of that. But in general, resistors can be anything. I, when I was using, we had the railgun projects a few years ago. Uh, we needed a way to discharge an entire bank of capacitors charged at 10,000 volts that were about 32 millifarads. That's a lot of energy. You can't use carbon resistors. But if we wanted a quick discharge, say there was a safety issue, what we did is took a long, um, this is tubing that's about this thick, and it's uh, the thick, almost rubber, but it's really a thick plastic, about that thick plastic, it's more than a plastic, but, and we had something about this long. It's like a piece of hose, that's long and thick. And we put corks on one end, corks on the other end, and before we put the second cork and the glue on it, and stick a wire through that cork to connect to that, we poured in copper sulfate. Now copper sulfate makes the water conductive. And we got it to be like a 40 ohm, 30 ohm resistance. And then we stick the cork on the other end, put the wire in. When I say wire, I don't mean a little thing like that. It's as thick as your pencil uh, going in, or your pen going in there. It's like a double lot wire. And then if we want to take the capacitors down quickly, we discharge through that. Now that is a different type of resistance completely. The wire would heat up probably 10 degrees. But if you try to do that with a carbon resistor, it would just catch fire. So be aware of these things. There's all sorts of tricks on what a resistor is. That's a resistor at low frequency. It's like RDC. Now what happens at high frequency for most resistors, especially the, you know, the carbon resistors you have, they have leads, right? They have pieces of lead material, pieces of metal on them. Well, automatically that lead material has an inductance. Automatically. And that's normally just written as L sub lead here. And keep this in mind, if you're ever building stuff, the shorter you can keep the leads, the better it is. And the less solder you can have on them, the better it is. The longer the leads, or the connecting wire, the more problems, the more inductance is out there. And not only that, this inductance also causes, uh, because it is a current going in there, there's always mutual inductance to any nearby wires, so you get signals straight into other areas. So the shorter the leads, the better. But then you get this too. Now in his book, he's gonna have a capacitance across there. Usually the capacitance you have to worry about is right here. 
And in his book, he says, this is the unwanted capacitance between the ends of the resistor. Now, here's why. When you're putting current through a wire, I mean a resistor, you're going to get a plus to minus voltage, right? That means you have positive charge accumulating here and negative charge accumulating here. Or there's a net capacitance. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's really what a resistor looks like at high frequency. But that is a simple model. In general, it can be much more complicated depending on the frequency and the arrangement. This is a first order model, and it's in his book on page, what, what page is that on that you're looking at? Uh, 508. Page 508. So what is the impedance of this? So if you're gonna look and say, what is the impedance of this? This is big deal here. If I wanted Z of this, I work in the S domain, I don't use J omega. I can do that at the end. I say, well, the inductance of a, I mean, the reactance of a, an inductor is just SL. The re reactance of a capacitor is just one over, of a capacitor is one over CS, and a resistor is still R. So now we can say the, the impedance of this is simply going to be SL plus, and then it's going to be one over, one over R plus SC. And that's perfectly acceptable, what I've just shown you there. If you look, S in general is given as sigma plus J omega, but since sigma is going to be zero if we talk about real frequencies, S is just J omega. I like using S and not J omegas. It's me personally. Now, if you look at this, what is the Z value of the impedance of a resistor when the frequency is zero, when S is zero? Well, that goes away, right? That goes away, it's simply R. Follow me? What is it at very high frequencies? Just look at that. At very high frequencies, this term goes away, doesn't it? Because it's a 1 over S, right? As S goes to infinity, this term goes away, it's SL at very high frequencies. There's a frequencies where it has the minimum value possible, that's the resonant frequency. And if I wanted to, I could get a common denominator here, and I could find the minimum of it. Couldn't I, class? You all see what I've done? You all agree this is the impedance of that? Now, if you want a common denominator, you can get it. You can say that Z here would be equal to SL times 1 over R plus SC plus 1 over SC plus 1 over R. And then you would go ahead and keep multiplying through. And eventually you get to a point where you're going to have S here, I mean S times S is S squared LC, and you would divide top and bottom by LC. And then in doing so, you get an S squared by itself. Then you would get a, uh, I mean, you divide by L, LC. You would get an S squared by itself, and then you would get uh, an S over RC, and then you would get a one over the square, one over LC here, and on the bottom you get something. But I'm not gonna even mess with that, because I don't expect you to understand this. Here's what happens when you look at this. If you plot versus the log of the frequency here on this, so these are like orders of magnitude. Like this would be zero. I mean, no. it would be one, 10, 100, and so forth. You follow me? That's log of frequency there. And on this, you would put 20 times the log base 10 of z here, and it would be the magnitude of z. So if you plot that with resistors, here's what you get. At very low frequencies, it just looks like the resistance. So this point would be 20 times the log of r. Write this down, this is not your book. He shows you a graph, but it is not done log in, in the true logarithmic scale, what it's usually done. This is a Bode plot that I'm gonna show you. Now, there's gonna be a first break frequency, just mark that down, I'm gonna join call that F lower, and then it's going to come down to this point, and this is going to be the resonant frequency right there, that's F resonance, and the resonant frequency is 1 over 2 pi square root of LCX, and then it's going to start going up. Now you all have had Bode plots, haven't you? You remember with Bode plots, the key thing was knowing if it's a 20 dB per decade fall off, or 40 dB, or whatever. For this one, it's going to fall off here as minus 20 dB per decade. 
and it's going to rain from the resonant frequency here, one over the square root of one over two pi square root of L C. This is one over the square root of two pi square root of L C X. This is going to be plus 20 dBs per decade. All right. Now the one thing Dr. Wimpus doesn't point out, this lower cutoff frequency can be important. And in his book, I don't think he shows this, but this is 1 over 2 pi RCX. That's the lower cutoff frequency right here. Does he have that, by the way? You can prove that if you want, and I can prove it if you want me to. I can do it. I can, what we can do is do this whole thing in a Bode plot, but that's what it's going to come out to be. The usual thing to keep in mind is the resonant frequency is the key point. Because anything above there is going up 20 dB per decade, anything below there is coming down 20 dB per decade until you hit the 1 over 2 pi RCX right there. All right? Can y'all see this? Okay. more notes on this. Now, after that, that's basically what you have to be aware of with resistors. And here's the thing. Anytime you're working out in this range, you've got to be real aware you're not near resonance. If you get too close to resonance, all heck breaks loose. You don't want that effect. Because a standard resistor that's 50 ohms or 100 ohms may look like it's only 2 ohms near resonance. Okay. You don't, you want, a, when you put a resistor in, you want it to look like a resistor at that value for the frequencies of interest. And if you're too far out, you're going to get too much, too much of a change in the frequency domain. Okay? That's my real point. Now, that's, that's resistors. When we talk about inductors, or better yet, uh, yeah, I think he does inductors next. Inductors, well, you know, when we, when we talk about inductors, Really, we're talking about something that you're used to thinking of as a component, right? You go to, you need an inductor of a certain value, you buy it, right? Well, the truth is that anytime you have wire, you got inductance. And the real thing that dictates the model you would use to estimate the high frequency model of an inductor is the path the wire takes. What's the most common inductor you think of when you do this thing? When you go and you buy something, I mean, suppose you've got to have, you've done laboratories with RLs, RLs, right? Well, what does an inductor look like? This round wave. Usually you've got a center rod and a coil of wire, just tons of coils of wire. That's an inductor in a nutshell. Well, the problem with an inductor is this. At low frequencies, there's no problem. But with an inductor, if you've got coils of wire like this, Well, guess what? Between here and here, there's a differential voltage. And between this turn and this turn, there's a plus minus difference, which means, believe it or not, there's gonna be accumulated charge, plus charge here, minus charge here, and so forth, you follow me? And the net effect of all these pseudo plates, they're not really plates, is that there's also a capacitance present. Furthermore, because there's a lot of wire, Wire, even though it doesn't have much, it has resistance. So now the model, and probably the most accepted model for most standardly wrapped inductors, and he'll show you that. Toroids are a little different sometimes, but most inductors have this model. You start with the actual element, L. That's, that, that's the inductance. Then after that, they're going to put a resistance here, and that has to do with the wire in the wrapping. Then what they'll do is this. They'll put a capacitor here, C. And this is a model that's usually used to talk about, if we're right here, that we want the Z in there. You all see what I'm talking about? You start with the element itself, that's L. When you got a whole lot of wire internal to that L, inside the inductor, there's got to be a resistance. Wire doesn't, just, unless it's superconductor, which there's, Really, not likely, but it is. So then you got a resistance. 
and a capacitance. And he'll probably call this CX and RX, but I don't remember if that's how he does it in the book. The X, to me, means you don't want it. <laughs> you got it. You wish it wasn't there. Now, what is the impedance of this? It's important to know what the actual um, Bode plug of this looks like, impedance versus frequency. Well, this has an impedance of SL. This has an impedance of 1 over SC, and that's just R. Do you agree with me? Now, here's how I'm going to do the next part. I want the impedance of this right here as a function of S. So I'm going to take these two in series right here and put it in parallel with that. Got me on that? So if that's the case, now I'm going to do the uh, Z1 times Z2 over Z1 plus Z2 formula, okay? I actually, I think, I'll tell you what, I'll do one over this impedance plus one over that impedance, but uh, it's going to be a little messy. So it's one over that impedance, which is SCX, right? And one over that impedance plus one over SL plus RX, and that's the impedance V. Agree with me? It's function S. Now, this doesn't bode well for seeing what's going on. So normally what they do is, for starters, multiply top and bottom by SL plus RX. So if I do that, now I get SL plus RX. So this is at least what I'm going to do. Then I get 1 plus SCX times SL plus RX. The only thing I've done is multiply top and bottom by SL plus RX. Agree? Then after that, we're going to go ahead and multiply the through. So I have SL plus RX over 1 plus S squared LCX plus SCX R, or yeah, CX RX. I'm down to here. And this is the one step I'd like you to pay attention to. What I want is the coefficient of S squared in the denominator to be 1. So I divide top and bottom by LCX. And if I do that, what do I get? I'm dividing top and bottom by LCX. So I get S over CX plus RX over LCX over, and then I have just S squared by itself, and then I have plus S, and I have RX over L, and then I have plus 1 over LCX. Are you with me? Now the reason I did it this way is because this quadratic becomes very important. The roots of that give me the resonant frequency and the lower and upper cutoff frequencies. And I'm going to show you how this really works. Now I'm going to put it in, you're supposed to put in S equals J Megan squared and stuff like this. But for now, this is good enough. Are you with me with what I'm at? Follow me on this. If we look at this and we take 20 times the log of the magnitude of Z versus uh, the log of f. And when I'm saying that log of f here, you make s be equal to j omega, which is equal to j 2 pi f, or f is equal to s over s over j 2 pi. But when you do that, what happens when you have an inductor is this, and this is important. The inductor if you take a look at it. Well, at DC, what is the what is the impedance of this at DC? Just take a look. What's the impedance of this capacitor when the frequency is zero? What's the DC? Huh? It's infinite, isn't it? One over S. If S is zero, is infinity, right? You agree with me? 
All right, so that's not even part of the deal. Well, what is the, what is the impedance of the inductor when the frequency is zero? Zero. Ah, so it's all just the internal resistance of the windings. Got me on that one? Now as you go up in frequency, so if you take a look at this, at very, very low frequencies, you're going to have this really small resistance. And then you're going to hit a cutoff frequency, or cut frequency, and it's going to start going up. And now it'll start going up at a rate of plus 20 dB per decade. It'll keep going up until it hits the resonance. And the resonance frequency would be, always be 1 over 2 pi, the square root of L times Cx. That's always the case. And then once it hits that, now this is a Bode plot. Remember, this is an approximation. This is an exact rep representation. Then it starts going down at minus 20 dB per decade. And down here, the low frequency cut point is 1 over 2 pi, and then it's going to be um, resistance Rx over L. And I don't think he has that in his, his notes, does he? He just shows you this resonance. And this is a big thing, resonance frequency. And here's why. You want to work well below with resonance. You want to be like an order of magnitude below resonance. Because if you get up here, I mean, what's, what's the value of the impedance? It depends on the frequency completely. It's changing 20 dB per decade. That's a factor of, well, I mean, that's a lot. It's a factor of 100 in, in, if it's a, uh, a voltage or current. Are you with the class? So that's the inductor. The fine. Remember, I'm giving five hours. So I'm going to finish this. I get to stay a little longer. The final thing I'm going to do, and that's the capacitor. We're not going to labor this one, but I think you all know what I'm going to do. For the capacitor, you know, what does a capacitor look like? Well, the best definition of what it looks like is a couple of plates separated by some kind of a dielectric. The shape of the plates can be anything. They can be spherical, they can be cylindrical, they can be something that conforms to a body, as long as they're separated by insulator. So the shape of the plates doesn't mean anything, but usually the way it's illustrated is like this. And that's called a, that's called a lump element because it lumps down whatever the properties are into a very simple visual identifiable thing. So that has a valuable a value C. Now, the big thing with capacitors is lead length. Hear me now. Usually the insulator here, unless it's called a, uh, uh, an electrolytic capacitor. Have you ever heard of electrolytic capacitors? They can store a lot of energy, but the thing is you can only charge in one way. You can only have a plus to minus charge on those. If you put a minus to plus, they tend to blow up, and that can be a problem. I've actually seen one for high energy capacitor. I've seen the aftermath of one that got a little, <laughs> didn't, didn't quite work with the polarity, and it just blew the crap out of it. So you don't want that to happen. The electrolytics can store a lot of energy. That's the reason they like it. But most of the time, if this is mica or any solid material, not liquid, they have very little leakage resistance. Some people put a little resistor here across it, and that's, don't have to do that. The thing you worry about is the leads. And in general, you're gonna have something LX. The lead length is the critical thing with capacitors. And then there will be some small, but usually negligible resistance. And that's the actual impedance Z of, I mean, that's, the, that's how you illustrate what it looks like. Almost all capacitors. Electrolytics are a little different, and I don't mess with, some of the high, super high energy dense, the super dense high energy capacitors, you do get leakage resistance here, and you have to incur, take care of that, but most part, no. Now for this one, if you look at this right here, this has an impedance of SLX, this has an impedance of simply 1 over SC, and this is just R, so the net Z is 1. That's going to be SLX, right? Plus RX plus 1 over SC. And I'm just going to draw this out for you, tell you that this is the log of F down here. 
and this is on this axis, 20 times the log of the magnitude of z here. And what it looks like is this. Well, what is the capacity, what is the, what is the impedance of this right here when the frequency is zero of the capacitor? Guys? Hmm? It's infinite, right? And a capacitor always starts in decent capacitor, unless they have a terrible leakage resistance. It's coming in as basically one over, or really it's 20 dB per decade, it's falling. It's gonna keep falling at that rate until it hits the resonant frequency. The nice thing about these resonant frequencies, they're all the same. So that's one over two pi L X times C. And then after that, it goes up as plus 20 dB per decade. And that's it. I'm gonna say one other thing about capacitors. In this day and age, when every, all these exotic materials are coming out, they're, they're playing around super high energy density capacitors. Now try to understand this. A capacitor is an energy storage device. It's an electric, it stores electrostatic energy. A battery is an energy storage device. What if you could get a capacitor that could store as much energy as your car battery and relative to the same size and weight? What advantage would that be? Just take a guess. What's the one thing about a battery you hate in 10 years? It goes out. You're gonna burn a battery out. It doesn't matter if it's lithium ion, lead acid. Eventually what happens is they become unchargeable. It's because of it basically erosion. Well, guess what about capacitors? They never go bad. Now think about the car industry with all the hybrid cars and electric cars, right? What if you've had an energy storage system that would never need replacement? Other thing too about that, if I need a whole lot of current, I can get it as long as I don't melt the wires. Keep that in mind. Uh, I can't get a billion amps of current out of a car battery. I can get a lot, but there's an upper limit by the internal resistance of that battery. And you'd be surprised, it's not like 5,000 amps, it's like about a couple hundred amps. Whereas those capacitors, I mean, I remember when we had the energy capacitors, we had 400 kiloamps, kiloamps for an instant. Yeah. Anyway, next time we're going to go into more EMC, and I'll try to make this as much application to our end. But I'll give you some homework on this one. Have a great fourth. Do you, is anybody going out of town here? If you're driving out of town, beware the police are going to be in force with radar traps all over. And please don't drink and drive. I even think in this area they have a courtesy take home I think, for the fourth and a half of life. If you give them a call and you need to lift up, no charge. <laughs>